Hello and welcome back to Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. Here's why you should tune in to today's show. A bankruptcy judge delivers a crucial ruling on Celsius, and it's got not good news for its customers. We're going to explain why. Plus, we're going to cover the latest in crypto options with Imran Laka. Stay tuned for that. My name is Mark Oliveira. So with that said, let's jump into the latest price action. I'll keep it brief, as there really isn't much action to talk about. Bitcoin is virtually unchanged compared to the same 24 hours ago. Uh, it's currently trading at around 16,800. It's kind of a similar story for Ethereum. Not much movement there. Not much movement there. Uh, ETH is changing hands for about 1250 right now. It's down slightly, but holding on to a 4% 4% gain on a weekly basis. Now let's move on to our main interview. But before I introduce our guests, for those watching us on the Real Vision website, I want to say thank you. Uh, if you haven't signed up there yet, though, check it out at realvision.com forward slash crypto. This is the best way to get early access to Real Vision content. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. With that said, let's bring in Imran Laka, founder of Options Insight. Welcome back to Real Vision, Imran. It's always a pleasure having you on. And you know, I'm sure you've been super busy as the, the new year has started, right? Hey, Marco. Good to see you, man. Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah thanks, man. Thanks. Um, well, I want to start off before we get into the charts, because I know there's a lot of stuff that we have to cover. I want to uh, start with our uh, our stories of the day so we can get them out of the way and get to the juicy stuff. Uh, and so our top story is actually bad news for Celsius users hoping to get their crypto back. Uh, U.S. judge in Celsius in Celsius's network's bankruptcy proceedings has delivered a crucial ruling, and it's not one that users would want to see. The judge said funds deposited in interest-bearing accounts now belong to the bankruptcy estate, not the users. We're talking about $4.2 billion here. That's because the judge said of Celsius... Celsius's terms and conditions that the users have to accept when using the platform. In related news, Bitcoin miner Core Scientific will shut down 37 mining rigs belonging to Celsius. So Imran, with these these stories here, obviously a lot of big impl implications for the wider cryptocurrency markets and for other bankruptcy proceedings like BlockFi. What do you make of this story? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm surprised by the story. I, th I think the, the mistake a lot of people made when they went and invested in crypto is they didn't understand that it was like a credit market, right? Y yields in the real world were zero, okay? So if you're all of a sudden earning 6%, 8%, 10% yields on crypto holdings, you need to realize that there's some risk associated with that, right? And that's what we call credit risk. And this whole DeFi market that was booming two years ago, it was basically just a new age credit market with a bunch of credits that not many people knew what they were really, how risky they really were, and yet they were seduced by all these massive yields um, mm. and, and kind of treating them as if they were bank accounts when they were quite far from bank accounts because they had literally had no insurance, they had no um, backstop basically like banks would have from the government. You didn't have that. So it's not a big surprise that the, the, the depositors are going to take it on the chin. Yeah, not a big surprise. And it's unfortunate indeed, because, you know, those yields were attractive. I remember, you know, seeing that and it's like, hey, even with like BlockFi and I had an account with them. And uh, thankfully, I was able to way before like all the stuff, the commotion, I was able to, you know, get out of of that. But I mean, I, I can understand that some, you know, some people who stayed around because hoping that the 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 things like stable coins would be safe, for example, um, you know, mm -hmm. or like having a stable coin account. And I'm sure that it's it's tough for them. So definitely, it's unfortunate. Oh yeah, it's it's definitely tough. But the, the big issue was that it just wasn't well understood. A lot mm. <clears throat> a lot of people didn't understand what they were getting into. And mm. and arguably that's the fault of some of these providers who didn't really make it as clear as they should have done that you are taking on the risk of counterparty default here. Know mm. that we're not telling you not to do it, but know that you're getting a yield for a reason. And if more people were made aware of those risks then maybe they wouldn't have just blindly thought of it like a bank account and lost and put maybe too much money in it, right? The idea is if you understand that you've got risk associated, you might spread your deposits around different entities. You maybe not put all of your money in there because you know that it could go disappearing and could go pop in the middle of the night. And so you kind of have some money parked in TradFi in real accounts. Um, and I, th I just think that that warning label should have really been much bigger and much louder. 
Yeah, definitely much louder. And it seems like a lot of companies, you know, use the terms and conditions, not just in crypto, but in general to kind of really throw some really sneaky stuff in there. I mean, when you use when you sign up and I mean, most people don't even read them and, you know, your privacy is all over the, you know, like it's they can monitor everything you're doing whenever you're, you know, searching on Google. So it's it's got, it kind of seems like a similar thing. And I think it's a uh, screams for like a wider kind of uh action that needs to be taken in the space so that uh, there's more transparency about what's exactly in those terms and conditions to make sure that people don't uh, get taken advantage of. But with that said, let's move on to the, the next story here. So the DOJ uh, is going to seize, uh, is, is talking about seizing FTX's Robinhood shares. Uh, it's another example of a, a bankruptcy proceeding. This one's a complicated one as well. Uh, the U.S. Department of Justice says it's it's in the process of seizing FTX shares of Robinhood worth some $465 million. The DOJ says it doesn't think the shares belong to the bankruptcy estates, but FTX, BlockFi, and Liquidators in Antigua have all staked a claim. So obviously, Imran, this whole thing with FTX has been a giant mess. It's going to take months, if not years, to untangle this. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this whole FTX saga as we're heading into the new year. Oh, I mean, it's it's so bad for crypto. I mean, it's made crypto take so many steps backwards. It's unbelievable, right? The the credibility of the entire space, the, the confidence of investors in the space has just been fractured pretty dramatically. And, and, and that's going to take some time to come back, right? So, you know, anyone anyone with hopes of a fast recovery in the crypto space, you know, is going to be waiting a while, I think. You know, the, the whole reason why it exploded so much and really went a bit parabolic um, in late 2020 uh, was because you had a load of institutional adoption and there was confidence building in the space that the infrastructure that was building around this industry was more secure and you could start to think of it like a real macro asset class. But what's happened since then, I mean, scandal after scandal, criminal after criminal popping out of this space, and these were some of the biggest players in the space. Yeah. Clearly, that's going to have a massive credibility impact. And then on top of that, you've got the government weighing in with uh, whatever crypto regulations and, and kind of using this as an opportunity to maybe get people to shy away from crypto and probably adopt CBDCs, which I, I suspect are not too far around the corner. Yeah, I mean, so I, and speaking about regulations, I mean, do you think that that's going to be where the full extent of the damage comes or have we seen the full extent of the damage or do you think that this case will, there's more kind of things to kind of... Um, no, you just, you know, you, you needed regulation anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just that it's a lot of bad press, right? So, so, so people are going to, some people are going to say, oh, you know, crypto is just a bit crooked and you can't trust it and, and stuff like that. And so... Um, they might try and push, like I say, they might try and push their own agenda of central bank digital currencies mm. and say that's a better alternative. What, why bother with crypto when you can't trust it when you can trust us, right? And and that's the fear. That's the concern. Now, a lot, the hardcore crypto people will not, you know, they won't then be doing that, right? It. They'll yeah. just be like, CBDCs, what, so you can control me even more? Like, clearly, right. they won't be interested but the mainstream people who were opening up to the idea of crypto being something they might want to park on their phone and have access to and put a few thousand in there just so they've got some, they yeah. might shy away from that now, right? And, and, and that, whole, that whole promise of mass adoption that we were thinking wasn't too far away uh, at the rate at which this was increasing, maybe that's going to slow down quite dramatically. No, yeah, I totally agree with that. I feel like a lot of the the people who are, um, you know, ma Bitcoin maximalists, they they would say, I mean, something like a CBDC, uh, you know, people could have, you know, if if you have a CBDC, you could get, you know, shut off for, like for wrong think, and um, and I I totally see some of the the genuine concern there, but definitely something that uh, I think we'll have to keep watching for to see how that uh, develops. I want to move on to this next story here. Uh, Coinbase settles for $100 million. So uh, U.S. crypto exchange Coinbase has reached a settlement worth $100 million with New York regulators. It's one of the biggest crypto settlements ever. The company has agreed to pay a $50 million fine for failing to adequately prevent money laundering. Coinbase will also invest another $50 million over the next two years on improving its compliance systems. You know, yesterday the shares of Coinbase rose 12%, but those gains have been wiped out today. Imran, mm -hmm. with, with the shares, you know, at trading at this kind of record low, are you looking at, at Coinbase right now or is there, what, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, so you know, the way the stock rallied yesterday is almost like they're expecting a much bigger settlement, right? So that settlement probably came in light from what the market was looking for, or, or maybe it was just a reaction off very oversold levels, right? These stocks have been absolutely hammered recently. So they were due a bit of a bounce. 
But, you know, I mean, Marathon um, Digital Holdings, that was up 24% yesterday. I mean, that's been absolutely smoked. But so some of these crypto stocks are winging around, even though the, the actual coins themselves aren't doing much, the stocks certainly are. I mean, I've, I haven't seen them this volatile in a while. Um, in terms of Coinbase itself, yeah, you know, I, I think it started to show a little bit of relative resilience, certainly compared to the miners. But then with the likes of Silvergate saying how big, you know, you know, with their outflows, um, I think it was like eight billion or something. Um, the idea is that volumes are going to be hit pretty hard. And so Coinbase's earnings are going to take a massive nosedive um, and they've been downgraded. So that didn't help the stock as well. Um, so I do think longer term, you know, it needs to find a base. It's kind of struggling to do that right now. It's been sliding for a while. Longer term, if, if, if it can survive, and I suspect it can, and the fact that they're making moves like spending 50 million on, on compliance is, is not a bad idea, given that, you know, they, they may be like one of the sole survivors that, because they're considered legit. Um, I think longer term, yeah, it probably isn't a bad uh, time to think, at least start thinking about dipping your toes in. Maybe you don't pull the trigger just yet. I mean, I still think the whole crypto space has got some more flushing out to do as risk assets are probably not bottom. So for, to think crypto is going to bottom whilst risk assets don't, maybe, maybe not, right? It is starting to decorrelate over, over, the, over the holiday period, for example. We couldn't move, but stocks were winging around still. Um, so maybe it is a case that everyone's kind of flushed out of crypto or a lot of people are flushed out. Anyone who's left is a long term holder and they're not necessarily treating it as the macro correlated asset that maybe it was for the last couple of years. And it does start to decorrelate again, maybe like it has in the past. Yeah, I don't know if that's how it's going to play out. Uh, but yeah, Coinbase start thinking about starting to think about longer term allocations, which you literally don't look at for two to five years. Um, mm. I don't think it's a horrendous idea. Yeah, definitely. Especially like you said, if if it is one of the players that ends up sticking around, um, so it definitely could be something worth looking at. Uh, On to this next story. Uh, so this is about NFTs. So 2022 was obviously a terrible year for NFTs sales, at least in the headlines. But maybe it wasn't so much, according to data from DAP Radar cited by Decrypt. Overall sales volume was close to the 2021 peak. That's despite big drops in prices. Um, and that's because of a very strong perform performance early in the year. The beginning of 2022 was so strong for NFTs that it managed to make up for the rest of the year. DAP Radar says that the NFT market generated around $24.7 billion worth of organic trading volume in 2022 across blockchain platforms and marketplaces. Imran, is, is NFT something that you even look at as an option trader? Is this something that's interesting to you? Or uh, what can't, do you think you of can't trade. You can't trade options on NFT, so I, I, that'd, be a, that'd be a hard no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe but, one but day. Just in general, I'm not really much of an art collector. And mm. so, you know, this is the transition into the digital art space. So I haven't really got involved. Um, you know, people joke and say this is this is basically the space for the DGENs, right, who, who like are buying random... Uh, you know, JPEGs and stuff like that. I, I'm sure there is some sort of application that NFTs will have in the future that will be considered useful. Um, and, you know, people are working on that. So, so I don't think they're necessarily worthless as a concept. But for me, yeah, it's a surprising number that 25 billion still um, last year in terms of notional value. Uh, but I don't, I don't get involved with it. I don't really plan to get involved with it. Um, it it's, I'll observe it. And I think for me, the only thing, the only reason it might factor into my my opinions or views or why I care about it is that the, the bigger that NFT space gets, the more activity that's probably going to happen on the Ethereum blockchain, right? Mm. And so that's just good for Ethereum ecosystem in general, right? Um, like for example, Solana, given the the collapse that it's had, it's, it's lost a couple of those big NFTs, uh, and they're they're moving over to the Ethereum blockchain and they're going for Polygon. So so I think you know it's interesting to see a migration towards the, what is considered the, the the blue chip blockchain that is Ethereum, uh, and and I think that's that's the thing I found more interesting in the in the NFT news recently. Yeah, bullish for Ethereum, uh, the better the NFTs do. And I was actually surprised too. I think when I was reading the article, it was some that says I think even though that the volume, I guess in terms of I I guessing the notional value of the amount, it was. I think it was almost double the amount of NFT trades because um, in 2022 compared to 2021, I think it was like 101 million NFT trades compared to 58.6 uh, 58 million in 2021. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's pretty interesting that, you know, the, the prices were lower, so obviously it wasn't doing as much, you know, volume, but 
it seems like more people were interested, at least especially in that beginning part of the year. So, um, well, well, that's it. I think it's time we we get into your charts, man, because I feel like this is what people are waiting for. This is what they want to know and, and and options. Let's uh let's start with the the realized vol chart. Uh, walk us through this uh, first chart and and let us know what's going on with uh with crypto the options. Yes. Yeah, right so really, the the big thing in vol space in crypto is just how dramatic the collapse in realized vol has been, right? I mean, it was starting to go quiet in December, but it just really took on another level, right? And 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 the fact that we got sub 15 realized vol in Bitcoin on a 10 day historic, um, and then sub 20 on Ethereum, and the, these are really multi year lows that you do not see very often in crypto. Okay, so so absolutely crushed on the on the yellow line. That's the realized vol. That's the trailing realized vol. Um, the implied vol just couldn't keep pace with it. So Whilst it did drift lower, uh, as, as it kind of had to, as, de as dealers who are long options are just bleeding and choking on them and just have to offload some of them. So you do find some natural selling, but, but then they are expecting some activity to restart this year and some movement to come back. We've got a couple of macro catalysts, like we've got CPI next week, um, and obviously got the Fed coming up at the, end of, at the beginning of February. So, so they're going to keep a little bit of uh, risk premium maybe in the curve and in the implied vols. But just generally, like these levels are, the, are like the lows that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Um, and crypto is just in a bit of a state of apathy right now and, and really needs a catalyst. And it's hard to really see what the crypto specific catalyst is going to be, certainly on the long side, certainly a bullish catalyst. We keep getting bad headlines, but we're so used to bad headlines now for the last few months that they're not new news. So, so bad headlines don't phase the market because all the sellers are done. And then we're, there's just no good news in sight, right? So when you finally get some good news, if you get some good news, and I, I, I'm not calling for any good news, but there, there would be a decent pop, you would think. But in the absence of that, the market kind of doesn't want to and doesn't need to go anywhere. Yeah, it's kind of, it seems like the market's just been kind of uh, trading sideways. And when, when we're looking at that chart, and I, I remember last time we spoke and we were mentioning, I think it was, we had, so when, when there's positive carry, it's like you're you're looking at kind of shorting the market. But because there's really no catalyst in, in there, I guess this is not an indicator that you're really. Um, I mean, you could sell vol if you wanted to earn that carry, but the problem is you're selling it at multi-year lows, right? Which multi feels lows, pretty yeah. rubbish. Now, yeah. you know, given, you know, three weeks ago, the setup was the same. You had positive carry, low realize, but you're going into a quiet period. So you had quite a reasonable confidence that the market was going to struggle to do anything, struggle mm -hmm. to move. But now, you know, with the same setup at the start of the year and with like with that big CPI number as well and the FOMC and, and the market trying to figure out how hawkish is the Fed really still going to be or not, and the dollar's kind of at this inflection point where it got beaten up and it's kind of threatening to bounce, there might be some movement, right? So then smash out a load of volatility um, at the lows uh, doesn't really feel right, I don't think. I got you. I got you. Yeah. And I, I, I do think that, like you said, mentioned the CPI number, if that's uh, if that isn't favorable, um, then that definitely could, uh, you know, or depending on how it goes, and it gives us some indication of how the Fed might play things out as we get closer to the, you know, the the coveted pivot date that they're, everyone's expecting. Um, I, yeah, do I think the on... risk. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think the risk is um, if we were to get a pop in CPI, because everyone's kind of now comfortable with the idea that CPI is headed lower. And, and the market's kind of starting to factor that in, right? We're, we're expecting cuts later in the year. Um, so if the CPI did come in high and, and market suddenly started to reprice towards where the Fed has been guiding at, at over 5% terminal rates and they're going to hold it there all year, if the market started to price that, then you would probably see a pop in the dollar and you'd probably see a bit of a, a sell-off in risk assets. And I, and I don't think crypto would escape that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I let's move on to the uh, next chart, the term structure. Uh, explain what's going on here and what what we're seeing. So these are just the term structures of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then I've also got the term structure of the spread between those two volatilities, right? And that's the thing I really like to track quite closely because that potentially offers some trading opportunities, and and it certainly did last year. Um, so both of the curves are in contango, which is upward sloping. Um, you've got a bit of a steeper one in Bitcoin as compared to Ethereum, but that is quite normal because people because Ethereum does tend to move a little bit more. So that front end vault doesn't quite collapse as hard uh, as Bitcoin does. And also we've got a little bit of a premium coming back to the weekly volatility because it includes that CPI number that we talked about. Um, you've also got um, this term. So this term structure of the spread, you know, that that popped below 10 vols earlier in the week. 
But then Ethereum's had a little bit of outperformance recently to the upside because that Ethereum Bitcoin cross was kind of carving out a triangle and it broke out of the triangle and it had a quick little charge of two or three percent. So you did have a little bit of a um, increase in Ethereum realized relative to Bitcoin, which is why this curve has then shifted back up a little bit and is now coming in at around 13, 12, 13 vols across the whole term structure. But what mm -hmm. I do think is that if we continue to be sleepy and not really realize um, and vols continue to grind lower, then the risk premium still lies on Ethereum volatility because it trades over Bitcoin. And historically, if you look back for a few years, that has got tighter, that has got like between zero and five vols that spread. So it still could cheapen up some more. And if it did get into the realm of five vols, then I think it looks like a really attractive thing to own. So I'll, I'll be keeping a close eye on that to see if I can scoop up some Ethereum vol against Bitcoin vol, uh, maybe in June or September expiries to give plenty of time for that to then reprice later on in the year. Uh, mm -hmm. But that might be a trade that makes sense. Yeah, that that seems like a something that to definitely watch for if it comes to five and and you're you're saying June and and, and September like you said for for time purposes and I would I would assume the same would, would be true if you're just looking at you know Bitcoin or ETH just individually is because if since we have short term expiration dates you know you would kind of be bleeding uh, theta so as we get closer to yeah. the the the, exp the the expiration date like even if there's no price movements or if the volatility isn't changing you're gonna lose money because you know, the it, we're getting closer to the expiration date. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you don't want to park yourself too short dated because that theta bill is going to eat you up, basically. Right? Yeah. You, want to, you want to try and minimize the theta bill. You want to own the volatility because you think it's good value and you think it's a mean reverting asset, which means it's going to go up at some point when there's a reason for it to move again. But if you park yourself too short dated, you're going to run out of time and that decay that decay bill is going to kick in too quickly, right? So And, the, and you've got no reason to justify owning short dated vol when the thing just doesn't move. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, so crypto doesn't live in a bubble by itself, right? There's are there are stocks that are are also tied into it that are affected by it. Uh, and, and I know that you have a, a the next chart here talks about that a little bit, specifically relating to uh, minor. I think some minor stocks. You know, walk us through what you see going on here. Yeah. So so you know we added this like um, probably in the last few months of uh, last year to to our process, right? So we used to just look at Bitcoin and Ethereum options. And that's what I was kind of focused on trading. But 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 I wanted to look at the kind of more liquid uh, single stocks that were, were crypto exposed stocks. So I've kind of broken them into two categories, which I called e the ETF type stocks and um, the uh, miners. OK, and I've kind of called Coinbase a miner, even though it's not a miner, it's an exchange. But it kind of trades more like the miners than, than, than that. Right. So, so that's kind of how I've, I've broken them down. Um, and you can see that, you know, obviously yesterday was a stellar day for the whole space. Mara was up 24%, Riot up 15%, MicroStrategy recovering strongly as well. Um, but they've had a tough time over the last month, particularly the miners, as you've had uh, this core scientific go, go bust. And these miners have basically stretched themselves, right? That they, they basically made the old mistake of over levering themselves. And now all of a sudden they, they're not making any, the, anything like the money that they were making. And now they're struggling to pay to pay those um, the cost of the, the borrowing that money basically to expand their operations. So that's why these miners are suffering. And I don't know how many are going to survive and how many are going to go bust. Apparently, hedge funds have been going after them, trying to take out the weak uh, and really push the stocks lower. Uh, but but you know, given the stocks have come down so much, you know, a 24% move in a day on the upside is very possible. And Mara could do the same again tomorrow if it wanted to, right? Given how far it's come down. So I'm not really playing in the miners right now. Um, the volatility is quite elevated, understandably, because they move a lot. I am short some put spreads in Coinbase uh, mm -hmm. as a way of kind of trying to buy the dip in Coinbase, uh, play for some stabilization, but with a limited downside exposure. Um, that trade hasn't made me any money so far. Uh, I may end up, it expires in Jan, 20th of Jan. I may end up binning it if the stock continues to make new lows. Um, but th those are the type of trades that I'm dipping my toes in, selling put spreads into weakness if I think we're we're due a bounce, but and I think those volatilities are quite elevated, right? But but I would never think about selling this stuff naked. I would always mm -hmm. do it via a spread because the mm -hmm. volatility, even if volatility is expensive, this stuff's just too toxic, right? I mean, who yeah. thought Mara was who thought Mara was going to get back down to three bucks? I mean, that, I remember that thing was trading at eighty for crying out loud, right? So so it's just you've just got to <laughs> you've got to be very open-minded when you trade crypto assets because. 
a 50% down week is always on the cards, right? It's, all, it's always possible, right? <laughs> so when you go in with that mindset, you're not going to be selling 10, 20% out of the money puts naked when you know that it's very possible you could wake up in a couple in the next day and, and see that kind of craziness, right? Yeah, no, you, you have to be careful with it, with this stuff. So it's really volatile. It's not a, uh... It's not a it's not a game to play for the for the weak willed or the yeah. The but if you know if you know how to control risk, there's, yeah. there's still lot there's still lots that you can do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, so uh, moving on to the next chart here, it's the uh, ETF and the miners. It's kind of related to what we were just speaking about. Uh, and I know I think this is this. I'm not sure if this is implied volatility that we're looking at, but no, this is just the spot prices. This is a relative performance, right? So you can see how. Uh, the, the green line is Bitcoin and the Bitto ETF, that's just tracking it, right? So on the ETF, on the, on the left-hand chart, ET, the Bitto ETF is tracking perfectly pretty much, right? So the slippage isn't very much there. But you can yes. just see how the other stuff got hammered, you know, by about 25%, right? MicroStrategy was off nearly 30% over the course of the month, and it's had a strong recovery. It's recovered half that. But that's, that's, that's how I like to just kind of check the relative trailing one-month performance of these mm -hmm. names relative to the underlying Bitcoin, just to see how these stocks are performing relative to the asset, right? To get a feel for, okay, these things relative to Bitcoin are getting absolutely beaten up or they're getting too stretched on the upside. Because ultimately there is a bit of mean reversion that happens around these things as well, right? Where um, mm -hmm. over the longer term, usually they're higher beta. So usually, you know, the miners especially will out rally Bitcoin and they'll also outsell off Bitcoin on the way down, right? So, so it's, it's always a good idea to kind of track their beta to, to the core underlying asset. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, for the people who, uh, the viewers might not, who not know what beta is, I mean, it's just kind of, it's an assets kind of, uh, I guess, uh, how an asset response to volatility in the market and if there's a higher beta you know that's gonna like for example if it was if the beta is like 1.2 or like come and beat bitcoin beta is one then you would expect a 20 percent greater move in in uh in the asset yeah, exactly, exactly yeah yeah exactly. um so moving on to the next one i guess it's the implied vol uh here i it's, I'm, i think it might be the strategy compass that we're looking at here the yeah, so this is the combined strategy compass. So, so I have my individual dashboards where I have the strategy compass for each individual asset. But with all these stocks, I kind of thought it made more sense to stick them all on the same strategy compass so you can see how they, where they lie relative to each other. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so the idea is that you're kind of determining where the spot is cheap or expensive based on Bollinger Bands. And then you're looking at a kind of 18-month percentile on implied vol to see if vol is cheap or expensive. So you can see that the coins themselves, like you've got the bright green in Bitcoin and you've got the bright red in ETH, the vols are very low, which we know, right? These are these are, these are the multi-year lows in implied vol. So we shouldn't be surprised to see the cross down in the lower part of the, the strategy compass. But then obviously the spot has had a bit of a rally recently, right? Ethereum had that pop. So based on how low the realize has been and, and the really tight range that we've been in Ethereum, that rally up to 1280 yesterday, I think it got to highs around there, that now makes the spot look quite stretched to the upside. So I wouldn't read too much into that because if you understand that it's Bollinger Bands that are driving the spot, uh, the, the spot measure, and if you know that it's been realizing nothing, then you know that the Bollinger Bands don't mean a lot basically, right? Because they're not representative of normal type moves in this asset. So, so I'm not rushing in to buy loads of puts in Bitcoin and ETH right now. But like I say, it's just good to see where these things are lying. And obviously, you, you see the chart on the right kind of shows the historical um, time series of the implied vol for all of these assets as well. And you can see that whilst Bitcoin and Ethereum have kind of collapsed, those all those stock vols have kind of stayed much more resilient, right? And they've stayed much higher and much more juicy, right? So, so if you are looking to sell premium, and like I say, the way I've been doing it is like via selling put spreads if I think the market's due to bounce, you'd prefer to do that in something like Mara or Coinbase or whatever that's on a really high vol in, in near 100 than doing it on something like Ethereum that's on a 40 vol or something, right? Or Bitcoin that's on a 40 vol. So, so there's just, again, seeing all of this place, seeing all of this stuff on one chart or on a couple of charts, it helps you kind of quickly gauge where, where the juice is, where things price relative to each other to try and help identify opportunities.
That makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, it looks like we so we have time to uh, to go over a few more charts. So I let's let's touch on the strategy compass that we have here. Let's start with the Bitcoin strategy compass. If you can pull it up, Arthur. Yeah. So this is the Bitcoin Vol dashboard, right? So oh, this sorry, is um, the dashboard. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So at Options Insight, we create one of these dashboards for every asset that we look at. Okay. So we've got it. We've got it for crypto assets, but we also got it for um, a load of macro assets, right? So we, we look at it on all the equity indices, FX, commodities, bonds, etc. Um, so the idea is, you know, it's trying to pull everything I want to know about what's going on in spot, in options, in realized vol, uh, in skew, all into one place, basically, right? And then that can help kind of guide me as to maybe what type of trades would make sense, or at least give me some insight as to what's going on in the options world, okay? Um, so obviously spot, you can see has just been flatlining, it kind of looks like it looks like it like someone who's passed away basically. <laughs> um, and then you've got obviously implied vol has been trending lower. You can see that on the bottom left chart. Now the carry indicator is like that speedometer that I've got there. That is just telling us that what we what we already know, which is that the thing isn't realizing right. So realized vol is a good 23 vol points below implied vol. Okay, um, so that's telling us that whilst options look cheap on an implied basis, to go and buy a load of them is not a no-brainer because the markets just aren't moving enough, right? So, so you want to see the strategy compass telling you to buy vol at the same time that the carry is more neutral to then mm. feel comfortable buying vol, right? Whereas here, you've got the carry indicator and the strategy compass kind of giving conflicting signals, which is mm. basically telling you to kind of sit on your hands right now, unless you have really, really high conviction that a move is coming for whatever reason, you would kind mm. of sit on your hands right now, yeah? Uh, if you then look at skew, on the other, on the top right, that's kind of tracking one month 25 delta and three month 25 delta. And, and that's just kind of telling us that skew has been kind of collapsing um, alongside volatility. So obviously generally skew still trades for puts because everyone's been quite scared and in need of hedging as the market's been in bear market for some time now. Uh, but that even that skew is starting to compress as risk premium in general gets faded because the market hasn't managed to break down any further below these key support levels. Bitcoin, like 15 and a half K, has held now for a while. Um, so the market's just getting a little bit more comfortable with the idea that they don't need to pay crazy money for the downside protection. And, and people may be opting more towards doing things like put spreads rather than outright puts, because they're not necessarily as convinced that this thing's got a real huge move to the downside from these levels. That makes sense. Um, when you're looking at the volatility carry and you were mentioning that and the conflicting signals, what is the per percentile rank below that mean exactly? That's just telling us where that carry is in, in where that carry normally would be, right? What's okay. the percentile of that carry measure? So what we're saying here is it's not often that you get 23 vol points of positive carry, right? It's a 90, it's a 91 percentile rank, which means it's almost about is about as much juice as you're ever going to get out of selling that front end, basically. Right? Got you, got you. Uh, let's let's take a look at the ETH uh, volatility dashboard as well. What's going on so here? It's, so it's going to obviously it's all very similar picture, right? There's there's not a, at the moment there's not a lot a whole lot differentiating them. I'd say the the main difference is that the term structure is a bit flatter. So if you look at the bottom right chart, um, that's the term structure. You can see how the green, it tells us what it is today, it tells us what it was a week ago, and it tells us what it was a month ago. So you can get a sense of the evolution of that term structure through time as well, which again helps us know how it is compared to what it was, right? Um, so you can see it's, it's generally been shifting down over the course of the month, but it is, it's not crazy steep, right? Because Ethereum has suddenly shown some signs of life, had a little bit of a pop. So may, maybe people are expecting a bit more realized. And so that front end has caught a little bit of a temporary bid. Personally, I don't think that bid's going to last for very long. I think once CPI and that is out of the way, that this thing's going to get hammered back down again uh, if the dollar doesn't have a big move. So, so but outside of that, still positive carry uh, in Ethereum, very similar to Bitcoin. Uh, the strategy compass is like, like saying screaming buy puts, basically. So if anyone does have holdings who and they haven't already bought any anything to protect them, it's not the worst time to buy a bit of protection, okay? Uh, but like I say, bear in mind that the rally, the rally up to 1280 isn't that big a rally, right? I mean, wouldn't be surprised if we get to 1400. If we get a real rally, then you should be looking at, you know, 1400 will get is, is how much, in percentage terms, just shy of 
or sorry, just over 10% higher. Uh, and then Bitcoin, that'll get you near 19K. Uh, it probably would be lagging. So, so you probably get Bitcoin to 18K and ETH to 1400. And then I'd probably maybe consider uh, putting on some fresh hedges if you haven't got them on already. Um, but here, I, I, I don't think there's a lot to do. Yeah, I got it. So um, if Bitcoin hits uh, 19 and, and ETH 14, then some fresh hedges. Well, I think 18 even. I think Bitcoin 18, 18 uh, yeah. is about 5% pop from here. And I think yeah. ETH, ETH 1400 is a 10% pop. I think that's kind of consistent with the idea that ETH's going to have a higher beta to the upside, uh, especially as it's kind of broken out of this little triangle that is created. So it could well have a little charge. If you got yeah. that, then that would probably be quite a good entry point for some fresh hedges, I think. Cool, cool. Well, with that said, Imran, we have some viewer questions uh, that I wanted to get to here as well. But before that, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you'll never miss the smartest crypto analysis. So <clears throat> this first question is from Ralph H. on the Real Vision website. And he's asking, how does Imran think about the difference between Bitcoin price in U.S. dollars versus euros? Does he see any interesting spread trades there? Yeah, I mean, I don't really um, look at the Bitcoin chart in euros. I, I'd rather just look at the euro dollar chart and have an opinion about that, basically. Right. So I prefer to sort of look at the Bitcoin chart in dollars and trade it, trade it like that and then separately look at the chart in euro and then euro dollar and then formulate my own opinion on that based on what I think about euro rates uh, and what's what's going on there, basically. Right. Or what's going on in the European economy relative to the US economy. So. It, to answer your question, I mean, I think I think the euro is going to struggle to rally much. It might have a little push towards 109. Um, that's probably about as high as I think it can manage. Uh, and then, you know, then, then I think um, what's going to go on with Italian yields versus German yields, uh, the fact that the European economy likely goes into recession, if it isn't already there, um, all these factors will we'll kind of put a cap or we'll put a lid on the euro in my opinion okay great point great point well uh let's move on to the takeaways it was a fascinating conversation today and i really only have like a couple so it's i would say that you know the you were mentioning that the crypto vols have been like at historic lows or record lows realized realized vols at record lows as well um you're looking at more so i would say uh june or uh, later on for per perhaps like some putting in some options because that's where people are thinking that there's going to be some volatility in the short term is not really some, you know, it's not as many great opportunities, but <clears throat> we might have some small things happen after this meeting with the CP, the, the meeting, the Fed meetings that's coming up soon and, and with CPI numbers. Uh, so those are my takeaways. I don't know if you have anything to add, Imran, to the takeaways there. Um, just in, in general, I mean, look, we, we do a weekly crypto um, product where I kind of run through what I'm seeing in crypto flows. We haven't really talked about that. There hasn't been a lot of flows over the last two weeks, to be honest, right? But just looking at what the smart money's been doing in options, deciding whether or not there's actually um, any smart trades in there that I'm that I want to copy. Right now, <clears throat> right now, the, the trades that people are doing to accumulate Vega look like call spreads in June and September. Mm. And what they're basically doing is they're saying, I want to own something in the at the money to maybe 30 delta zone, okay. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to sell that way out of the money tail, that 10 delta call area. So what they're doing is they're still buying Vega, but they're controlling the carry. And what they're also doing is they're getting into a, what we call a long skew position by being long the calls closer to the money and short the calls further up. And the reason they're doing that is because if the market was to rally, what do you think Vol's going to do, right? If the market grinds higher, you know, Vol probably still has some more downside. OK, but, but especially in June or September, because that's because that curve is quite steep. So if right. the vol does continue to go lower and you're long Vega, usually that will cost you money. But if you do it via those call spreads, as you rally that skew, provided the skew still remains for puts and people are still fearful of an ultimate downside conclusion to this bear market, then, then you might get this re-steepening of the skew that is currently the other way round on those upside options. And that will protect you, basically, right? So uh, there's some smart vol players who are thinking that's your optimal way to accumulate vol right now, and uh, and I kind of agree with it. So for me, like as and when I am willing to start accumulating vol, and I haven't really done it in anything meaningful yet, I, I don't think that's a bad way to go about it. 
Yeah, it's a very, it seems like a very interesting, but somewhat complicated. It, it uh, is a little bit complex, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for, um, but definitely very interesting uh, there. Uh, I Before, uh, you know, we I let you go, Imran, I, first of all, I'd, I want to mention that you have a, you, on YouTube, you really, you release a lot of great content, and I definitely want to plug that, you know, Options Inside Imran Laka. Um, how can people keep up with you? Uh, it, you know, oh, there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways. <laughs> so obviously my YouTube channel, uh, I release daily videos for macro. I release weekly videos for crypto on there. <clears throat> they're, they're just like snippets into what I'm doing for my subscribers, basically. Um, so you get you get a feel for what, I, what I'm doing and, and kind of how I think about things. Uh, we've also got um, an options course that's going to get released on Real Visions Academy. Um, so that's something I did a couple of months ago with, with Roger Hurst. Uh, you know, there's some great content there for people who don't really know much about options trading and want to learn more. So make sure you check that out. Uh, and then my Twitter, um, lots of stuff on Twitter there. Uh, lots of uh, our content that we share on there to kind of uh, to show, show people what we're up to. Can you give us a sneak peek of what some of the stuff that we're going to cover in the uh, in, in that course there? Are we going to, and I'm sure people are probably confused sometimes they hear the the um the greeks and they're like what, what are they saying you know and i'm sort of like do you, you guys cover that or what are you guys covering 100 percent, yeah i mean okay so sneak peek i'm not sure if i'm allowed to do this right but i'll, I'll give you some very very brief snippets so <clears throat> we go into the greeks but we present the greeks in a totally different way right to make it more accessible and more intuitive we don't talk about we don't get into any of the maths and deriving black shoals and any of that nonsense because let's be honest i've been trading for 20 years and I've hardly ever used Black Shoals in my life. Um, usually that's done for you in your option pricing model. You don't really need to derive it yourself. Um, some people might disagree with me, but that's kind of the way I see it. So what I care about is how option premium behaves, how those various inputs feed in and what they mean and what the Greeks mean to me and what they mean to how an option price is going to behave. OK, uh, so we go over that. Uh, we, we also um, kind of we cut the course is not your run of the mill options course, right? It's like. We, we don't present it like a textbook. It's kind of breaking down who the main players are in the options market and how they think about trading options or volatility and what their motivations are and why they would do what they do and how, how to make some of those decisions that they're making, basically. So we're trying to present it in pure real vision style, uh, a, a lot more intuitive, a lot more real, hopefully, for people than, than some of your stereotypical option courses out there. Amazing. Well, for anyone who's interested in that, uh, head over to realvision.com forward slash the academy uh, and get get signed up. Uh, and, and Yeah, I mean, that, I don't think it's, it's not out yet. It's out next it's out in a couple of weeks, I guess. Right. Roughly. Yeah. It's out this month, basically. So check it out. Out this month. But I, I think I did hear that it was going to be out next week or maybe it is the week after. But yeah, out this yeah, month. Yeah, I think that's the yeah the goal is next week, I think. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, anyways, awesome. thanks again, Imran. I really appreciate you coming on to the show. Mate, always good talking to you. And I look forward to the next one. Yeah, me too, man. Um, well, that's it for today's show. Uh, if you're not a subscriber yet, don't forget Real Vision Crypto is free. Head to realvision.com forward slash crypto. For those of you watching on YouTube, remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date with our latest crypto analysis. Join us again tomorrow. Real Vision macro legend Jim Bianco will join Ash live on the show. You don't want to miss that. See you at noon Eastern, 5 p.m. London, live on Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing.